everybody live in the pits of motor chaos. This is Dave. I got on the line with Nostalgia Pro Stock driver Gordon Moore. Hey, Gordon, how are you tonight? Doing real good. How about you? Pretty good. The weather's cooled off now. Yeah. So, Gordon, first question, uh, what got you started in drag racing? Do what now? What got you started in the drag racing? Uh, I actually grew up around drag racing in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I'm the youngest of four, and my older brothers, uh, one is now 61, and the other brother would have been 60, 63 now. Um, and we started going to Capitol Raceway and Old, and Old Dominion Speedway and Bud's Creek, Maryland, Maryland International Raceway back in the early 70s. Um, and, you know, as being the kid brother, I was the tag along, and I'd get to go and uh, watch a lot of big cars and watch a lot of little cars. And, uh, you know, we kind of got into it from there. And at that time, there were quite a few cars in our hometown of Arlington, Virginia, that were nationally known. Um, you know, even at that time, you had uh, Bonnie Burkett was starting her career off at that time when she was running her post-doc Pinto. And... Uh, she actually was there, and you had Gene Altizer was there, and there were several cars that were probably within about a stone's throw of my house. So we got to go around and meet a lot of those folks, and that's kind of what got me going. So what, what year did you start racing your first car? Uh, I started actually racing in 1984 before I had a driver's license. Um, I, uh, I ran my mom's car. She had gotten a brand-new 84 Thunderbird. And she had previously had a 72 340 Cuda. And at 14, I managed to talk her into taking me to Old Dominion Speedway. And uh, we swapped drivers outside of the gate. I paid the entry fee and ran Street Eliminator at Old Dominion uh, about six times in 1984. But up to that point, we actually had uh, been running a car at Old Dominion with my older brother, Mark. Um, he was the 61-year-old. Uh, we had a Cougar that had actually been a NASCAR ultra stock car, which was like an AFX type car, um, in the 60s and early 70s that we had bought, or he had bought in like 1977. And we ended up taking that car and putting a 460 in the car with a C6 transmission and stuff. And we started running that car in 79. I guess that would be considered our family's first real drag car, if you will. Um, and uh, eventually it ran 11 O's, about 125 miles an hour in like 1983. And uh, it was a very successful bracket car locally there. Um, you know, and I was a tag along, you know. Anytime there was work to be done, uh, you know, on the engine, transmission, sanding on the car, doing what needed to be done, I was kind of the go-to because I was the kid brother. So been around in a long time. So your, your family was involved when you started racing then? Yes. Yes. Now, how many uh, drag racing cars have you raced throughout your career? Uh, I've had, right now, I've had about five different cars total. Um, I still have my first car, which was bought in 1985, June 27th of 1985. It's a 65 Mustang Coupe um, that we put together with a bunch of leftovers and parts and pieces. Um, and that car uh, has been through several incarnations through the years. It had a 302 in it. Uh, when I first started bracket racing, I guess you could say full-time in 1986, the car ran in the 12s at like 110 miles an hour. Uh, got my feet wet with that deal. And then uh, in 1987, I built a Windsor for the car, and it ran like 12 O's, 11 90s. And then in 89, I back half the car. Um, and the car ran like 11 70s to 11 90s, somewhere in that range, um, with the same Windsor. And then I had an opportunity to buy an Opel Cadet Gasser that was pretty well known around the D.C. area. Um, it was built by Don Hardy back in the late 60s, and it had belonged at one point in time to Jim Yates and his brother Jeff. And they had run the car with a big block Ford and a Turbo 400. And uh, I got a real good deal on the car in 1992. Um, and we put my Windsor in it, and the car ran like 1120s, 1130s. And I ran that until about 95, at which point I was going to build a new body style Mustang because I was a Ford technician by trade for a long time. And uh, I sold the Opal and the Windsor and all the pieces and was going to build a tube chassis 94, 95 body Mustang, but ended up not being able to get a body in white. And in 1995, about June, 
I decided, you know what, I'm not going to wait around any longer, and I cut the 65 up and went to Vanishing Point Race Cars in Telford, Pennsylvania, and bought a kit and put the thing together in one car garage. Um, and I've still got the car today. And then uh, we ran that car throughout the years, and then we had a dragster for a little while with a small block Ford, and it ran pretty good. Uh, ran 540s in the eighth mile down here. And then uh, the dragster deal was boring to me because there's electronics and power glide transmissions and air shifters and all of that, and that's just not my style. Um, and essentially, we uh, traded the dragster rolling for another Opal Cadet. It was a station wagon and put the engine in the wagon with a C4 transmission, three-speed, and the car ran like 670s, and then uh, we ran that car for about four or five years off and on, and um, then we got the bug for this Nostalgia Pro Stock thing and decided, you know, let's maybe think about looking around and doing this, and uh, in 15, we found the Mustang II that we currently have put together as a Nostalgia Pro Stock car, um, and with the help of my partner, Dr. Ronald Burgess, uh, we were able to procure the car and uh, put the thing together. So now, how did you come up with the name of the car? Uh, it's kind of an interesting story there. Uh, being that my family's been involved with this drag race and stuff for all these years, and, you know, we've been around it basically 45 years now when you look back at it. Um, 1977 was the first Mountain Motor Nationals um, pro stock race at Bud's Creek, Maryland, and it was put on by Todd Mack and Larry Clayton, and it was a Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night. Uh, run what you brung, hope you brung enough, throw the rule book out the window, and my oldest brother um, took me over there, and there were probably 40 to 50 cars on the property, and mind you, at this point, I'm probably a seven or eight-year-old kid, and by this point, I was sealed in the deal that I was a Ford guy, and we watched the race, and it went on and on and on, and it probably went till about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning, Thursday morning. And wired for sound, uh, I asked my oldest brother, I said, you know, I said, if you had a pro stock car, what would you call it? And he said, if I had a pro stock car, it would be called the Rhinestone Cowboy because that song was very popular on the radio at that time. And uh, it kind of stuck with me through the years because he and I were pretty close. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't live to see all of this come to fruition. He's been gone about 21 years now. Um, and uh, when we started putting the car together, we looked at doing a wrap on the car and doing some different things. And I just kind of stood flat-footed and said, you know, I think I'm going to call this car the Rhinestone Cowboy because that was the name that my brother came up with 40 years ago, almost, at that time. And, uh, you know, we're just budget racers. You know, we run... Uh, stuff that we've had, stuff that we've bought, used. Um, most of the parts and pieces are period correct pieces. And, um, you know, it's nothing really fancy. It's pretty much built as a late 70s pro stock combination. So that's pretty much where the name came from was my oldest brother. So what uh, drag racers were inspirational to you when you started drag racing? Do what now? What drag racers were inspirational to you when you started drag racing? I'm going to tell you straight away, from a little kid on, Diner Don Nicholson was my hero and still is to this day. Um, I'm very fortunate to call his daughter uh, Cindy, my friend, through Facebook, and I've had several conversations with her. Um, she She's really been nice about the whole thing, too, just talking with her about her dad's car and stuff. But Dino was my guy because... The guy was so calm, cool, and collected. And I don't know if you've ever seen all the pictures that were taken of him match racing and doing all these things. Anytime you see pictures of that guy in that car leaving the start line, he's got a big old smile on his face. And, you know, he had his heyday in the 60s with Ford where he had the big sponsorship and all that. But by the, he was kind of in the twilight of his career by the time I started following him. And he really didn't have a whole lot to spend on the stuff. He was running stuff that he had and that he could come up with and uh, basically training his protege, John Cozzi, at that point. And, uh, you know, he just was always kind of cool, and he always took the time, because at that time he did a lot of match racing in the D.C. area at a lot of those smaller tracks, and he stayed with Dickie Estevez, who actually still lives in Maryland, about two miles down the street from the old defunct Aquasco Speedway. And uh, we'd always make a point when we knew Nicholson was in town, we'd stop and see Dickie. 
because he's a Ford guy too. And, uh, you know, getting to know Dino a little bit and talk with the guy and all that, he always made time for me as a kid. It never brushed me off. And that really kind of, I guess, had a big effect on me and the way that I run my program and try and go forward. Um, you know, it's not always about the, the biggest engine or the biggest amount of money spent. It's more about, you know, are you doing this because you love it? And that guy, I swear to you, I know he won the championship in 77. Um, but, you know, he, it's been said many times by John Causey and others, he would rather win a match race, best two out of three, at some rat hole track in middle Virginia somewhere. And he took as much pride in that as he did winning a national event. Um, he was motivational and inspirational. Um, my older brother, Mark. My older brother, Mark, if, if it was not for his involvement, he was the mechanical brain in our family with this deal. And I followed along and was there from the beginning with him. And if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. He was very inspirational to me. Um, you know, and there were several others along the way. Uh, Jim Yates. Jim Yates was a Ford guy until he went pro stock racing. Um, he was very motivational. And uh, there's a lot of guys around that time frame. Now, let's go back to your first first uh, drag race of your career. What was it like getting behind the wheel for the first time? Well, after, after standing on the starting line um, for about five or six seasons with my brother and doing all that, because back then you didn't have the rules where you had to be 16 and all of that, um, you know, here you were this 10, 11, 12 year old kid, you're back in the car in the water and you're doing the burnout. And back then you didn't have the prep tracks like you do today. You had to put your own VHT out. And that generally was in an old pop mallet bottle. And, uh, you learned the routine and how to look at the car and watch what it was doing. After waiting five or six years to be able to get behind the wheel of the car, it was a very exhilarating, very, um, it was a rush. I mean, and the thing of it is the poor old car only ran like nine seventies in the eight mile. You know, it was not fast at all, you know, by today's standards. You know, you figure most of these nostalgia pro stock cars, they're running between 460 and 530, 540 in the eighth mile. But, you know, just to be able to get up there and, you know, do a couple of dry burnouts in front of the water and, and pull the car up, stage the car, and see the tree come down and, uh, you know, drive it out the back. And, you know, the first time we took the car out, I went three rounds in the car. Um and it was fun, you know, just just being able to do it. I tell people all the time, I'm old because I actually raced on a five amber Christmas tree. <laughs> so, so what's the quick quickest run time you've had with the current Pro Stock? Um, we're still sorting the car out. The car has been five twenties, um, early shut off passes. Um, this this clutch deal is all a new thing to me. Um, I ran automatics for years. And that's actually what I do by trade. I'm an automatic transmission man. But when I built the Nostalgia Pro Stock car, I felt like it needed to be correct and be a clutch car and have a stick shift type transmission. Um, obviously, with us being budget racers, we didn't have the money at this point to buy a Lenko transmission. So our car actually has a Liberty Pro Shifted Doug Nash transmission from the late 70s in it. Um, so we are still like technically a clutch assist type car. Um, and that's been what I won't even call a learning curve. That's been like a learning ladder with no rungs on it, trying to climb up the outsides. Um, I would say once we get the car sorted, it should probably run somewhere between a 490 and about a 515. Um, you know, and it's all production-based stuff. Uh, it is a stroker. It's 516 inches, um, but it is a production block, and it is actually a production offset ground crank um, it's got good rods, it's got uh, 16 to 1 areas pistons in it, and uh, it's tonal ram, it's got turbojet jet type heads on it like Nicholson was uh, running in 78. It's essentially a, a loosely based clone of Nicholson's first and the sevens combination that he ran in 1978. Um, and it's kind of a funny story because you talk about inspirational racers to me, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Tony McCormick who had a machine shop in Beltsville, Maryland at the time uh, when I was a kid. And Tony was from down in my area here in North Carolina, and he moved back down here in the late 80s. And uh, he's essentially, uh, he was a big Ford guy. He had Paula Murphy's old Miss STP Mustang and had cut that body up and made it into a bracket car and then did some match racing with it with big block Fords and that kind of thing. And uh, when we were 
the cowboy together and had the car, I had a friend call me on the phone and said he had a short block that he had taken in trade, and uh, if I would be interested in it, and when I went over and looked at it, and I started checking some stuff on it, that short block was actually built by my friend Tony McCormick in 1999. So there's a little bit of legacy in the car, even from back in those days. So what year was the car? What year was this car built? Uh, this car here was built actually in the early 90s. Um, it's not an original pro stock car. It is a it is a clone or a tribute car. Um, but with that being said, we were very specific in what we were looking for to do this with because. You know, being that we wanted to do a late 70s car, we were looking for a Mustang II, a Maverick, or a 79 to 81 Fox Body Mustang. Um, and we found this car, and, you know, the cars from the 70s, they had that rake to them, you know, where they were way down in the weeds in the front, and they were jacked up in the ass end. Right. Um, and this car had that look to it. And after seeing some pictures of the car um, and where it was at, the car actually will certify to 749 because the entire rear roll cage and the rear frame rails and all of that were redone in the car in 2005. It is a four link with a wishbone, with an anti-roll device, and all the back half stuff is chrome molly. But it was originally an Alston Pro Gas chassis car with two by three frame rails and A-arms in the front. Well, not sure if you're, if you know or if your listeners know, Alston Pro Gas chassis was actually designed off of a late 70s Pro Gas chassis. And this car still has the main 2 by 3 frame rails from the four-link mounts forward with A-arms up front. So the only thing holding us back from a faster certification would be if we cut the car up, you know, took the main rails out, redid those with chrome molly, and put the two front down bars in. Um, which, you know, for what we're doing, we're really not looking to do that. Um, the car was owned by a gentleman by the name of Scott Elliott at one point in time in the 90s. Um, and then it was sold to a gentleman by the name of uh, Brian High, and I'm actually fortunate enough to have met those guys or through Facebook and stuff, and uh, Brian's a good friend. And, uh, you know, we kind of knew what the car looked like and where it was at, and uh, Brian had contacted me and had video of the car. He and his dad had run that car as a bracket car for a while with a 600-inch big block Ford and a power drive, but the way the car left, the way the car worked, and, you know, watching video of it go down the racetrack, um, it essentially, it looked like a 70s pro stock car the whole way down through there. It leave with the wheels hanging high, left front wheel higher, and the car moved around. It's like, you know, this is a good fit. This is a good fit for what we're trying to do here. Because, you know, it's if it's going to be a tribute car or it's going to be a clone car, I feel like it should look the part. It shouldn't be, you know, a new body, a new, body, a new chassis, uh, beadlock wheels and all of that stuff. I mean, I realize some of the faster guys need that stuff, but we want the car to look the part. Right. So uh, how, how many crew members do you have for your car? Well, our whole big super crew here, if you look, um, you've got me uh, as the driver, owner, builder. Um, we've got my good friend Corey Warden, who I've worked with at a dealership uh, before, and he comes over and helps all the time. And then you've got my sons, uh, Nick Moore, uh, he pretty much tows the car to the races and helps, and he's got the trailer, you know, that we use most of the time. And uh, he actually has a bracket car, too. We're building a nostalgia pro stock car for him, 78 Pinto. Um, and he's been a big help. My son, Thomas, he has been an awesome help. Thomas is uh, the mechanical mind like I am uh, as far as trying to work on the car and know what he's looking at and doing the deal. Um, we have another young fellow who's kind of a protege of mine. His name's Thomas Yancey. Um, he's a real quiet guy, but he will throw in and do anything you need him to do. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have the connection with Dr. Ron Burgess, my friend and partner in the car. Um, and if it was not for him, this would have never taken place. Um, we have uh, Doug Schmidt, who has Pro Stock Restorations and Recreations, who's doing the Gap and Lash Pinto and restoring Dr. Ron's McEwen and Williams Pinto. Uh, he provides input all the time to us, and he's a real good friend and helps when he can, uh, even from afar. Um, and then you have my brother, Mark. Uh, he's been down for the races with us and done some stuff. And really, uh, and the other one, too, is my nephew, Jeff Moore, uh, my brother Mark's son. Uh, Jeff actually lived with me here for about three or four years, and um, 
he's been really good help as well. So, I mean, we've got a lot of guys, and they're all volunteer. I mean, there's no there's no paid, and, you know, they all work full-time jobs in dealerships and shops and do different things. But anytime we talk about bringing this car out or doing something to this car, there'll be 10 people here to help and do what needs to be done. No. And, of course, my wife, Julie. I mean, she's she's awesome. She doesn't physically work on the car, but the moral support and putting up with my stupid ass for the last 25 years now, um, you know, what more could you ask for? <laughs> what more could you ask for? Because she allows me to do this, even, you know, on a budget-limited deal. Yeah, that's great that you have your wife support like that. Now, Absolutely. Now, do you have any sponsors currently for the car? Uh, the only current sponsor I have is my partner, Dr. Ron Burgess. Because um, I tell people... Uh, throughout the years, you know, our stuff might not be the fastest, but basically my sponsorship has always been what uh, Bob Glidden referred to as AP Finance or Ass Pocket Finance. Um, if I don't have it on the hip, I'm not going to do it. Um, you know, we've done side work and done all kinds of stuff and stacked cash to try and do this deal. Um, this is probably the first time in my career over the course of the time that I've actually thrown out and spent money to do things, you know, over and above what I have done over the years, you know, buying good parts and buying good pieces. It was kind of a, from my kids, oh, and then one other person too I need to mention from our crew is uh, Lee George. Um, he's kind of like one of my adopted sons in this whole deal. And uh, Lee, he's kind of a trip. He's kind of our go-to guy for everything. It's like, hey, Lee, air the tires up. Hey, Lee, put the gas in the car. And it's like, yes, sir, I'll do it, Mr. Gordon. You know, it's just, it's a really good thing. Um, but as far as physical sponsors who put up money, uh, nobody. I mean, we run it out of our shop here at the house. Um, I actually am self-employed, build automatic transmissions and do general repair work and some fabrication type stuff uh, with roll cages and setting up cars and that kind of thing. Um, more automotive and performance. So that's that's my business. Right. So how many events have you ran in so far this year? Uh, we actually have only had one down this way. Um, there was one other four-car match race that was at Z-Max um, about three weeks ago with some of the guys from our Southeast Outlaw and the Stouts of Pro Stock group. Um, but uh, unfortunately, my crew couldn't get loose of work, so we were unable to attend that one. Um, we're looking forward to doing some testing with the car uh, here the first week or two of October. Um, and then we're going to be scheduled to be at Virginia Motorsports Park October 28th with the Southeast Outlaw and the Stouts of Pro Stocks. Now, for you, do you prefer the quarter mile or one-eighth mile? Well, you know, growing up in that area up there, I really do like the quarter mile. Um, but quite honestly, the fastest I've been in the quarter mile has been about nine flat. Um, and I've been down here in North Carolina now for 14 years, and everything here is on the eighth mile. Um, and with that being said, uh, you know, that's pretty much what we set everything up for. And... With the Nostalgia Pro Stocks, honestly, uh, I think with the eighth-mile stuff, it makes the cars look a lot closer to put on a good show for the fans. Um, because, you know, in saying this about Nostalgia Pro Stock, my opinions of it are this. It needs to be three things. There needs to be a race that fans can see and watch. There needs to be a car show where you can have some of the older guys come out that ran the stuff back in the day with some of the restored cars that they're not going to run because they're worth money. And it also needs to be a history lesson so we can get the younger generation involved and let them know, hey, look, at one point in time, post-stock cars were not bubble cars. They were not, you know, all Camaros or Camaro stock, as a lot of people have referred to it on the net and on Facebook. You know, you had brand parity. You had all of these things. Um, you know, I remember being in Englishtown, New Jersey, in 1983, and there were over 40 pro stock cars on the property of about every stripe you could think of. Um, you know, and, and you had Forbes, Chryslers, uh, GMs of all stripes, Mercury's. Uh, hell, you even had Larry Paternal there was uh, Chrysler Imperial at that time. So there was a lot of there was a lot of cars and a lot of interest in the class, and uh, I think that you know. The modern cars are really quick, and they run really well, but the show is not there. I mean, uh, looking at Indy with the burnout competition, that really, you know, look at the fans that were going back to to watch the class that for years just didn't watch. 
you know, there has to be some show there. Right. Oh, so what are some of your favorite racetracks? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I've got a lot of little small rat hole places that I really like. Um, I really, when I say rat holes, but I mean just the local places. Um, you know, the one I miss the most is Old Dominion Speedway. Um, I'm good friends with uh, the Gores who own that. And when it closed at that point in time in 2012, it was the oldest continuously operating drag strip in the country because it had been there since 1953. And I guess it was because that was old home week. You know, that was um, racers who had raced there for decades and, and generations of racers through family that were there. And it always felt like home. Um, I really, in all honesty, um, have a new favorite that I'll enjoy down this way. We went to Fayetteville Motorsports Park about three weeks ago for a classic gear jammers race with the black uh, 65 Mustang, and uh, that's a really neat place. It's an older track. Um, at one time, it was called Cumberland County Drag Strip, and uh, the place looks like a golf course in the pits because it's got the, the big hanging pines and the sand hills and all of that, and it's kind of a neat place. Uh, the track prep was awesome. Um, as far as big tracks go, um, hands down, uh, my old home places, Bud's Creek, Maryland, where we started up there, and uh, Capital Raceway in Crofton, Maryland. Uh, Capital's going through some ownership changes and stuff, but I know the new guy's trying to really put a good program together um, to keep his bracket program alive. But a lot of folks don't realize, at one point in time in the 60s and 70s, Capital Raceway was pretty much the Orange County of the East Coast. Um, the place has got 10 staging lanes. The track was super wide, beautiful facility. And at one time before they had the fancy... Uh, you know, the starters for the supercharged cars, they actually had the roller starters in the ground there like they had at Orange County and stuff. This is a neat place. Um, and another long defunct one uh, that's kind of a ghost track now because it's still there was uh, Quasco Speedway in Maryland. Uh, that track was closed in 79. Uh, we were there for the last race and it looked like somebody closed the gate, put the lock on it, and never came back. So, he You've got a lot of places that, you know, you've been and been to. I've actually, um, that's one of my hobbies, I guess you will. Um, when we travel and go different places around the country, I like to stop at different tracks, open, closed, or otherwise, and just kind of check the places out. Um, I'm not, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of the Z-Max thing. I think it's overkill. I think it's overkill. I'd rather have a more intimate venue, if you will, where people can get up on the cars and be close. Right. Beautiful facility, but it's not really, it's not really my style. I'm more of an old school kind of guy. I like the, I like the old places with the wood bleachers and the soul. You know, it's you've got, you've got to have the connection with the fans. You've got to have the connection with the facility and places like that. It's like going to the freaking hospital. Yeah. Now, Gordon, throughout your uh, drag racing career, have you had any accidents or near accidents? Um, I have had a couple of close calls in the 65 um, about 15 years ago uh, we were running through some suspension issues with the car with it being a home built deal and uh, for a long time we ran basically what I like to call lump motors in the car low compression stuff um, pretty basic stuff ran like 10 O's, 990's and I built a real nice 460 for the car and the suspension wasn't set right in the car and uh, it decided it was going to unload the suspension at about a thousand feet and the funny thing is, is the kid that was helping me at the time, uh, yeah, he was a kid then, but now he's like 32 years old. Um, he says, I came back and the car kind of got loose out there in the middle, about a thousand foot down course. And I came back and the kid was white as a ghost. I said, what's wrong with you? He goes, dude, I could read your name on both doors. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, the car was sideways enough both ways. I could read your name on both doors. Um, I figure the cowboy car is going to probably be a little bit of that once we get everything hooked up and rolling, um, especially the first few times we take it to the quarter mile. So it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment. Um, you know, the good thing about that car is, like I said, we do know um, that it has been proven, and the car has been 820s at 170 miles an hour with the previous combination that was in the car. So I feel pretty confident getting in that car and going after it. Now, Gordon, you ready? Well, that's pretty much it. You ready for the fun fun segment question of the show now? Sure. If if some if someone 
get said Gordon here's 150 150 million dollars and say Gordon build me a new drag race track where would you build it and what kind of features would you put in it um I gotta be honest with you I would probably try and build it somewhere on the east coast um between Philadelphia and Raleigh North Carolina uh kind of like where Virginia Motorsports Park was built several years ago um and I would want to see you know I'm not a fan of the four wide thing. I would just like to see a real nice top notch facility with uh, a lot of amenities for the spectators and for the racers. Um, more so for the racers because I feel like a lot of these places, um, you know, in the interim now, the racers are not really taking much in consideration. But, you know, that's, that's pretty much it on that aspect of it. Wish I had a better answer for you than that, but, you know, just a, just a real nice facility would be the thing. Do you have any hobbies outside of drag racing? Uh, my wife and I like to go travel quite a bit. We have a daughter that lives in Seattle, Washington, um, which I should have mentioned her too. She actually was here uh, the first time we took the car out to Wilkesboro for the inaugural Don Carter Memorial Race. Um, my, my daughter Hannah and my granddaughter Addie, they actually flew back and stayed with us for two weeks at that time, and she was a big help then too. Um, but we travel a lot. Um, and go see family, and we like to go to the mountains and go hiking. I mean, in Western North Carolina, there's a lot of state parks and stuff like that around, but we can get to go and do that. Um, and we're right on Lake Norman. Uh, eventually, we'll have a boat, I would like to think, and we'll go out and do some of that. But, I mean, drag race is pretty much it for me. That's that's my thing. I enjoy doing the other stuff, but it's always coming back to the drag racing thing. Okay. So, Gordon, what's your favorite food? Oh, uh, Mexican. Green chili enchiladas. Favorite my, mom, uh, my, mom, my mom was uh, half Spanish, and she was actually from northern New Mexico, about 100 miles from Colorado. And uh, as I like to say, I can pick out fake Mexican food, food from like 10 miles away because, you know, you go to northern New Mexico, if it doesn't have green chili on it, it's not Mexican food. Favorite beverage of choice? Do what now? Favorite beverage of choice? Uh, I enjoy a nice cold beer. <laughs> um, you know, usually during the day, during the work day, we drink a lot of Diet Cokes and water and stuff like that, but, uh, it's always nice to sit down and have a nice couple of Bud Lights and hang out and do your thing. Um, fairly cheap date. And I guess if I, uh, I drink hard liquor, uh, wild turkey is my deal, as they say, when it's, what time is it? It's turkey time, but, uh, not so much anymore. I'm getting too old for that. Favorite vacation spot? Uh, Top Sail Beach, North Carolina. Uh, the, the place is awesome. It's uh, the southern out of banks between Jacksonville and Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, it's not overdeveloped, and uh, it's a nice, quiet spot down there. Favorite music? Uh, I'm a metal guy. Um, growing up around D.C. in the 80s and all of that, uh, actually, Kicks is one of my favorites. I uh, got to go to Kicks. Uh, big fan of like the Foo Fighters. Uh, actually, I've met Dave Grohl on several occasions when I lived up there. Uh, there was a little pool hall we used to frequent, and uh, when he would come home, because he's from that area, he would actually hang out in that pool hall. So we'd shop pool and drink beer with Dave Grohl and um, like that. And uh, big on the '70s stuff too. You know, growing up from that era, uh, Southern rock and even some of the disco stuff and, and that kind of thing. Just get fired up for going racing. My my wife wanted me to ask you, have you ever heard the band DRI? Uh, I have heard them, but it's been a good while. Okay. Slayer. How about Slayer? Uh, not heard them. Metallica, Megadeth? Oh, yeah, from the old days. Right. Metallica before the sellout. Right. Um, actually, my brother Mark, the one I was telling you about when we got into the racing thing, when I graduated high school in 1987... Um, we went to the Monsters of Rock show at RFK Stadium, and that's when Metallica still had not had any airplay on the radio. And uh, it was a general admission show, and we got about six people from the stage on a 60-degree day, and it was probably about 130 degrees down there. And that was probably one of the coolest experiences ever. <laughs> was, that, was that the show that Van Halen was on? Uh, believe so. I, I believe so. It's been a long time, because, I mean, at that point... Um, you had uh, the Monsters of Rock show, uh, was Kingdom Come was the opening band, and then you had uh, Metallica, 
you had Scorpions. Yeah, Van Halen was on there. I went to that show in Wisconsin. And then Van, and then Van Halen, or Van Hagar, as it were, at that exactly, point, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yep. Now, for you, if, if you were in drag racing, what do you think you'd be doing? Man, it'd be hard to say, because like I said, you know, this is what I've done my whole life. And, you know, it's funny, if my brother Mark was here to tell you, um, he worked at a Ford dealership, and uh, Old Dominion, when we started racing, the funny story here for you, uh, we started racing, we went on Friday nights at Old Dominion, and I'd get out of school about 3 o'clock, well, this is like back in elementary school days, and the school was like less than a tenth of a mile from our house. I mean, you know, you walk there in five minutes. And I would start calling the dealership, blowing the place up, asking him when he was going to be home. They thought he had left me to go to the racetrack. And finally, and this is like, I'm probably like 10 years old, baby. He goes, hey, dumbass, look out front. The car's on the trailer. I haven't left yet. You know, I mean, this is all I've ever wanted to do or be around. And it's the only place, honestly, in my life that really feels like home is just being at the racetrack and around racetrack people. Now, Gordon, if you were able to do time traveling and go back in time, would you do anything differently? Um, there's probably a few things I would do a little different. Um, love my wife, love my kids and all that. But it's like I told her, uh, we actually had this conversation tonight. Uh, if I could go back to when I graduated from high school, um, I probably would have gotten in a car and ridden to either Whiteland, Indiana, or somewhere and picked one of the pro stock teams and said, hey, look, I want to come to work for you, and, you know, if you can pay me $100 a week and give me a place to lay my head, I could care less back in the heyday, um, you know, because, you know, it was really big then, and quite honestly, my whole entire life, as much as, you know, we had nitro cars and all that stuff around our area, and, uh, you know, the gasser cars and all that stuff, this pro stock stuff is all I've ever really cared about from the time I was a little kid. Um, I was, as a kid, even had, like, you know, dreams that this is what I wanted to do was race pro stock. And, you know, obviously we know that that's very cost prohibitive now for anybody, even with big sponsorship. And when the nostalgia pro stock thing came along, it's like, you know, this is something I can do. And, you know, this has just always been my class. And, I mean, if I could change anything, I wish I would have really gone for it a lot sooner in life than I did. So what, what interview did you listen to back in the heyday? Do what now? I said, what interview did you listen to back in the heyday? No, what interview of yours did you listen to? Uh, what? Of uh, mine? Yeah. No, my wife was asking, what interview of mine did you listen to back in the heyday? Well, the one, the one that got this started for me was with Dr. Ron. Here's a question. Yep, Ronald Burgess, Dr. Ron. Yep, yep, oh, old yeah. Dr. Ron, he's a hell of a character now. I'm going to tell you, he's a really good guy. And, uh, you know, and uh, just so we don't leave Bob Merrily out, uh, Pro Glass kicks ass. So he put me up to that one too, but Bob's a pretty good guy too. And, you know, a lot of guys give him a hard way to go, but I really think he has the best interest of the class at heart, quite truthfully. So you heard the back in time interview question? Yes. That's why you were prepared? <laughs> uh, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Possibly. I kind of figured that out. Well, you know, the thing of it is, is if you go look around, and even like on my Facebook page from uh, the spring, from the spring, uh, James Amos, the Be On Video guy, he came to Wilkesboro in May and did a documentary type movie that he's working on now and came around and interviewed all the drivers. Um, he spent quite a bit of time with me, and we talked and stuff, and he was pretty happy with, you know, the conversation that we had. And if you go back and look through... Um, my Facebook page, you'll see my interview from last August at the inaugural Don Carlton Memorial Race, and uh, it went pretty good for a while on that deal, and, you know, talked about the class and, and the direction of it. I mean, I, I really think that the Southeast, if we can just get things rolling and get the fan interest there and get the tracks to schedule us some events and do the deal, I really think we'll take off here, because this is kind of the hotbed of this stuff from back in the day, you know? And you've got a lot of older guys here that want to come out and see the stuff. And, um, you know, my interview from last August that I had at Wilkesboro, I had basically about nine hours of sleep in six days at that point because we literally finished that car up um, Saturday morning of the race at like 3.15 was the first time we had fired the motor. 
Okay. Literally. It, we got the motor running and had it running for about five or ten minutes. Like, load the damn thing in the trailer. We're going tomorrow. Win, lose, or draw. And she had guts. Okay, Gordon, let, that, me tell, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. These questions, I've written them out three years ago. These questions were not nowhere over the Internet. Nobody had these questions before. I wrote these questions out three years ago. So it seems like right. the person who interviewed you probably stole my questions. Anyway. Well, just, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I... It's okay. I, I'm, okay. A pretty, I'm, a pretty, I'm a pretty low-key low guy. I mean, I, you know, I shoot from the hip, and a lot of guys will tell you, um, I'm not, I'm not the taste for everybody, as it said, as they say. Right. Um, and I don't know that I have a taste for everybody. Right. 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 Any last words for the? Well, what's your fondest memory of, in your drag racing career? Hey, truthfully, my brother Mark and myself, we've had our ups and downs through the years, but the racing thing has always been the connection. And win, lose, or draw. Our our event last August at the Don Carlton deal didn't go the way we wanted because we fought some new car troubles that you know anybody would have fought. But my fondest memory is probably the 15 days leading up to that race and the day of that race. Um, we worked on the car nonstop. I mean, literally like 18, 20 hours a day, people going in shifts. And I was here. I took off from work. And at that point, I was working at a Ford dealership. And, um, you know, we're thinking we're not going to make it. And Friday afternoon, we ran into some bugs and, and all of that. And my wife comes up, she goes, here's this box that you kept asking about that got dropped. Dr. Ron had actually gone to Carl White Safety Equipment and ordered me a complete brand new driving suit that you've probably seen pictures of on Facebook. And it has rhinestone cowboy embroidered on the back of it. It's purple and black. It's got Ferguson Moore on it. It's got my name embroidered on it and all that. She says... I was told by Ron, if you get discouraged and you're ready to throw in the towel, to open the box. And, you know, just that. And then that Saturday, my brother, I wasn't sure if he was going to come. Because my nephew was coming with his car, but I wasn't sure if my brother was going to come because he still lives in Virginia. And my brother showed up, and I'm unloading the car, and he rolls up and gives me a big old hug. And he says, dude, you made it. You finally did it. And to see, you know, the 50, 60 people around my car up there, you know, here, I'm just this guy, you know. I've been around this stuff a long time. I've got a lot of friends. I know a lot of people. But just all this, this help and family, and, and I consider them all to be family and extended family. You know, just how everybody threw down. That that 15-day stretch, you know, that's... Those are my fondest memories of this stuff. And, you know, it's not even about on-track performance. Well, hold on. It's not even about a win. Hold on, Gordon. I got one minute left. I got to get this in before the show ends. So, your wife likes it when you get down and dirty in the car? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That was my final statement. Well, thank you for your time, yep. Gordon. Absolutely, and thank you all, too. I definitely appreciate it. We'll do this again in the near future. Okay, great. Y'all have a good evening. You too, my my dear. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.